Entrepreneurs will save the world. We chat with successful entrepreneurs who share their journey and the lessons learned along the way. The Add Value to Entrepreneurs podcast is edutaining, leaving you with actionable advice to transform your life and create a thriving business that aligns with your values and goals. Our conversations are for entrepreneurs who want more freedom and fulfillment from their work so they can live the life they desire. We focus on the mindset shifts entrepreneurs make to increase their influence and impact in the world. It's time for you to add value. This episode is brought to you by Perfect Publishing. Perfect Publishing is a different approach to publishing a book. Perfect Publishing is sharing a project of hope called The Dose of Hope. We carefully chose heroes of hope who exemplify living a life they created through faith, hope, patience, and persistence. No matter what page you open to in this mini cube of hope, you will find a leader with a big heart. You will see you are not alone. The authors may share similar challenges that only hope and action could resolve. Get your free ebook at addvalue2life.com slash dose. Add value to life.com slash dose. Today's guest is Chris Voss. Chris has been a CEO, serial entrepreneur for over 25 years, building and managing a multitude of corporations in differing fields of the social industry. He's also one of the top 1% searched for on LinkedIn every year. His experience in business ownership and controlling interest investments range from mortgage, real estate, stock market, investing, retailing, computers, clothing lines, talent agencies, courier companies, personnel companies, call centers, construction, paper call industry, club promotions, and social media. Chris Voss and Robert talk about Chris's incredible business building experience. He shares a business secret that he calls a crazy Ivan. We talk about the mind of a child and engaging the human spirit. Chris shares business wisdom from the trenches to help you grow your business. Well, Chris, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm just uh, looking forward to uh, learning some stuff and, and learning about your journey. Thanks, Robert. So am I. Uh, <laughs> tell, I'm always trying to learn about my journey as well. <laughs> That's a good thing. All we all we really have is the journey. We if we could figure that out, then then we we got a pretty good handle on things. You know, it's interesting. I, you know, I wrote my book at what fifty three, I think I was at the time. Um, and I, I the joke is, is that uh, at this pace, the second book will come out when I'm one hundred eight. Um, but you know, the older you get, the more you can look back on the path that you you took and the uh, the the, the uh, destruction that you left in your wake. You can look back, you know, over fifty years and be like, yeah, I probably should have seen a counselor. <laughs> well, even, like, even those of us that have seen a counselor look back and wonder how the heck am i not dead i think on mine yeah you look at that you're just like why is this guy still alive and you're also like he could have used a lobotomy couldn't we have got one of those rose kennedy things when he was young but uh <laughs> best advice go, go go see a psychiatrist early people especially <laughs> at challenge childhood just just go see one for fun it's uh you'll be surprised what you don't learn or learn i don't know it depends on the psychiatrist really i i tend to agree i think there's some that would dig up some stuff that may or may not have really happened you know the funny thing about psychiatrists and it, i, I mean, it's funny but a bit macabre they have the highest suicide rate of any of any uh career did you know that i i did not i thought it was dentists <laughs> I think it's I think it's Dennis one and psychologist two and and they take turns year to year, um, but y y you know the the irony is is you're like wait you guys are supposed to know what's wrong with yourselves so I don't know. Well, there's there, there's a lot of folks in the coaching profession that definitely still need a coach. <laughs> that, that's the other thing that always interests me. It's like hear about people that are coaches that need coaches i mean i just recently saw a coach who uh who i guess one of the top coaches and does a lot of stuff turns out he's been living in his car in san diego for uh the two or three years that he's been a coach and he finally admitted to it and he counsels people on relationships but he's divorced his wife or his wife's divorced him and he's living in his car in san diego for the last two years and you're like do people pay you for advice they must not be paying you much like i don't know <laughs> Like you don't want relationship advice from me. I've been single all my life. You know, 
If you want dating advice, I'll give it to you, but that's not in my book. So. <laughs> All right. We're going to get way off track here if, we don't, if we're not careful. So yeah. um, so tell me a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey and, and what, uh, I mean, you've been podcasting before podcasting was a thing. So <laughs> yeah, I started my, I, I talk about this in the book. I, I wanted to lay out in my book, Beacons Leadership, a thing that would um, uh, help other people. Uh, you know, I've had authors on our show and uh, an author said to me one time, she says, you know, I really struggle with writing. And uh, I I had a gal meet me one time to, at a book signing and she said that she'd been in prison and my books had inspired her and all the women in prison to do better and change their lives and come out. And she said, I didn't realize that, you know, I was having that sort of impact. And she said, you know, there, there's somebody out there who needs your book, who needs your entrepreneur experience and your, and your expertise. So you need to get this book out because there's somebody that will, that it will help. And, uh, and so that's been great. But so I wrote it to give people inspiring lessons, the toolbox that I use to be an entrepreneur. At 18, I became an accidental entrepreneur. I tell the fun story in the book uh, about how I got fired from McDonald's for long hair and uh, began my entrepreneur journey. <laughs> um, and, uh, and all the some of the adventures that, that you know that my life and and some of my thoughts on business on leadership and principles that I used so that people could have a toolbox and go hey maybe I could use some of this stuff or not you know maybe I'll just read it and it's, you're like that's some good entertainment that guy's a moron <laughs> it seems way, like it seems like people it like it. even so either way buy the damn book or seriously already right, it's on <laughs> Amazon. <laughs> So, so let's talk about what, what led you to podcasting. Uh, I think it was community time that was ordered by a judge for some sort of event in my life. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, that was uh, other things. Um, the, uh, so I, you know, I went through this entrepreneur journey. I built an empire of companies I talk about in the book. And, uh, then the crisis of 2008 hit where it wiped out a lot of people's businesses, wiped out my whole little empire. And so for a year or so, I was kind of adrift going, Oh, what do I do now? Like, uh, 20 years of me building an empire and what was supposed to be, you know, retirement future had been wiped off the planet. And, uh, uh, so I, I started noticing these people were into Twitter and I, I was like, what is this Twitter stuff? You know, and that back then it was fairly small. I think it was like 2008. And, uh, but I was like, what is this going on? What is social Twitter? What is, what is this? And so I started playing with it toying and experimenting like I do with everything in life. And, uh, I just became like one of the top people on Twitter at the time. I was on the top thousand people, you know, the stars and everybody hadn't fully come on to it. I think Oprah had just barely gotten on. And uh, I learned how to master the game. And it was a great game because you're like, wait, if I tweet out links to my business sites and I push this tweet button, you know, and back then you would get like just thousands of hits. You know, I could get like 7,000 hits like a day or a week or something. I don't remember exactly, but I remember the 7,000 figure. And I remember looking at it going, so I just have to push this button more. Like, talk about my This is great. This is like the best promotional BS ever. And so um, at that time, there was a lot of people doing things. And there was a lot of experimenting. There was a blog talk radio that came out. And uh, I'd always been the CEO, the boss, the big mouth, the guy who has to sell the vision to everybody. So I have to sell, you know, the investors, the employees, the salespeople, you know, the, the board, um, the vendors, everybody. You know, you've, you're constantly selling. You're constantly selling the vision, you know. People are just looking at you like, shut the hell up, right? But that's what you have to do, especially when you have large companies or a large amount of employees. You've got to go around and do little stump speeches. And so um, I was so used to being the voice, you know, writing the newsletter for our companies and, and constantly selling vision. And, uh, uh, you know, I just have a big mouth. And so to me, I was like, yeah, I love to do radio. That might be fun. You know, give me something to run my mouth off with and annoy people with stupid thoughts that I have. And uh, podcasting was one of them. Uh, we, we formed the podcast uh, when we formed the Chris Voss Show. And uh, so the Chris Voss Show was doing a lot of tech and reviews and social media commentary at the time. And then uh, we had the podcast to go with it. Didn't know if it was going to go anywhere. Had the YouTube channel, of course, too, as well. And it all just kind of hit. 
and uh you know we were just banging everything toying with everything there's lots of really cool radio that was coming out at the time that you could do over i uh in the internet like over twitter and you could do like different radio shows so i i was trying all that kind of stuff yeah and so what what stuck i guess what what actually you know helped your business grow uh the podcast went well the youtube channel went well uh it, it was kind of weird i remember i wrote about this in the book i uh i got called up very uh, after a while on twitter because twitter didn't twitter had like 40 employees or something and they didn't think they'd ever need more and they they were not keeping up with everything and so there was like a band of us that literally became like twitter uh gurus if you will i hated that word back then but uh twitter people and of course we do a lot of customer service we be like yeah here's here's who you contact when your accounts get suspended it was really it was really a crazy time and uh somebody called me up one day and they go hey man you're kicking ass at this twitter stuff our company would like to do the same thing we'll pay you to come teach us how to do that and i was like you pay me for this stupid stuff i just make up as i go along and experiment and found it worked sure i need money so that began my first check and uh after that i started teaching social media i'm like well here's you know and a lot of people did and so it grew out of that from a business of that and then of course doing product reviews and tech commentary speaking and uh just being you know one of those social media socialite influencers if you will nice so let's talk about transitioning the podcast as it grows to to monetize you know monetization of, of the podcast itself yeah so a long time for a long time my uh, properties were always based on um it's it's a multifunctional property uh let, let me see if i can explain it so when we built the chris voss show um we i was doing commentary reviews and of course you get speaking gigs and and consulting gigs and you know everything else i should probably book out back then um and so you get all that and so you're basically you know you're on youtube uh i was getting fat checks back then from youtube for the product reviews we were doing and commentary and of course the podcast early on was on youtube as well and so you get money from that uh and then uh you got the blog so you know ads you used to get more money from ads than you do net these days these days you don't get anything um and so you just you, it was all just it's a hodgepodge mixture of exposure commentary getting your stuff out there you know four hundred thousand people on my twitter account uh before i friended too many people i guess one day and this suspended the account uh, i'm like i'm using your stupid software and they're like no you friended too many people you, you're horrible um and so but <laughs> At you least know they I were would, clear what you did wrong yeah but i would be if, if they i'm still fighting to get my account back um, but if they would give me, uh, you know, LinkedIn, I was top LinkedIn, I was, I was top everywhere. You would just dominate every single platform. Google Plus, you know, when it first came on, you know, you have the, your audience, you take them everywhere, go to everywhere. And so um, and so now it's it still is a mixture of the YouTube checks, the speaking, the, the consulting, you know, now there's the book that helps get you more gigs. Um, the podcast you have people on, you know, and the, the higher the presence you can go on there, the people we have on the podcast are top notch. Uh, you know, the hottest books, the authors that come out, uh, guys who've written lots of books. Um, we've we got the top journalists that come on the show from CNN, NBC, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, um, co editors of, of great uh, journalistic things, Pulitzer Prize winners um you know you just build it and it takes time to build and once you've got an audience behind you and and you want to make it the way you do it's, it's there but it takes a long time to build and i've just always been i've just always been that rolling machine you know i'm not jumping from every you know trend you know oh oh we got to jump to this trend we got to jump to that trend um you just you just stick with the machine and make the machine better so you, you mentioned the word experiment. I like I like that word when it comes to entrepreneurship, when it comes to to business, right? You, mm -hmm. you try it, you tweak it, you try it, you tweak it, and that willingness to to experiment. Can you dig a little into into your your viewpoint of of experimenting? Yeah, um, I talk about that in the book. There's a lot of different techniques that I put in uh, the crazy Ivan technique that I use, uh, the ways that I used to innovate the uh, the uh, nine dot square experiment i forget what they call it, the nine dot square experiment where 
uh, you learn to think out of the box. Um, I try to put a lot of my in innovation toolbox because most most entrepreneurs have like a toolbox, and it's kind of the catch-all go-to, especially when you get off the basics. You know, sometimes you get a little too fancy. Sometimes you tweak something too far, and it goes from profitable to bankruptcy. <laughs> um, you know, and then you gotta go, hey man, we're bleeding money here. We gotta, what do we do? We we clearly overdid something, and you're like, oh, somebody got. Chris Voss got a little uh, fancy and fancy pantsy and decided to tweak something. And now that's what's screwing it up. And so you, you, you go back to basics and you go back to your toolbox and go, okay, let's go back to work again. Let's quit uh, drinking all the drinks and partying with all the girls and going to all the bars. And, you know, let's get back to showing up every day at work and doing the grindstone. And, and that's what made you successful. Um, so, you know, uh, lots of different stuff I put in the book of some of my techniques and, um, those are really important to have. So I shared them with people that, you know, made a difference. You know, I wonder, I never went to college. I started my first company at 18 and, and, uh, you know, our mortgage company, owning a mortgage company, looking at people's lives and their finances and how they live their life. You, you learn a lot about people and everything else. And then we had a lot of other companies. You, you just kind of learn from life if you pay attention. But, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So, so I guess we got to dig in a little deeper about why we have a submarine defense uh, reference as a as a beacon of leadership for. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the crazy Ivan story is kind of an interesting one. I called it the crazy Ivan from uh, Red October, and remember how he would uh, check his six every now and then. And so, one of the things I always have with my innovating is I always go back over what we did and, and, and double check things and triple check and quadruple check. And so to innovate, one of the problems you have when you innovate something, you know, so let's say you take your widget, you go, I'm going to paint it bright colors and, and it suddenly starts selling and you're like, this worked, this is awesome. And then suddenly it doesn't stop. It stops selling. Or maybe you need to go back to that process in your business and say, why, why do we do that this way? You need to approach it from a new angle of why do we do things this way? And Because the problem you have when you're the CEO or a leader or the innovator, people go, well, you made it. Like, I mean, I, I thought you were all the all-knowing, all-seeing God. So clearly you couldn't have been wrong or clearly there couldn't, it couldn't have been made better. And so for me, the crazy Ivan is sitting down uh, and looking back on, uh, uh, on an item and really challenging it and go, well, why is this here? Why do we do this? You know, uh, where I became successful as an entrepreneur was learning to walk into departments and look at it and go, why, why do we do things this way? Why? Like, this really doesn't make sense sometimes when you think about it. Maybe, maybe there's too many steps in a process that, that are, are, you know, increase the cost where you can't, you can't, you know, if you, you've cut out some of those things, you can save some costs and maybe make it flow more efficiently. <clears throat> And so uh, those are some of the processes you look back. Uh, I talk in the book about how one of the things I used to do was take retreats with a yellow pad, no phones, just a yellow pad, and go to like a bed and breakfast or, you know, take off for the weekend. And I would take a part of my business, you know, like, uh, I don't know, the processing department, the telemarketing department, the sales department, and, uh, and I would go and I'd break it down. And I go, why do we do things this way? And of course, my brain would be like, because you're the idiot who made it that way. And I'd be like, okay, but why does this make sense? And sometimes, very rarely, there were times where I would go, actually, this is the perfect model that I think we can build this to. I did a good job. But I, I, I could challenge it and understand why, why I'd rebuilt it. I'd be like, oh, yeah, so that, oh, yeah, now I remember why we did that. Yeah, okay. Ah, uh, you know, that makes sense. But a lot of times, I would find little, little errors or little tweaks. Or I'd be like, hey, you know what? What if we turn this knob? We turn that knob a little bit, like you talk about the experiments. Oh, oh, wow. We get better results. Sometimes you don't. I mean, but that's the fun of it. But you've also got to recognize that very quickly. So that's where the crazy Ivan comes in. Uh, part of the crazy Ivan, too, is sitting down with your people and going and really challenging them. Like, why do we do this? Why are we doing this? Should we do this? You know, like, here's a proposal. And uh, we, we think we're going to do this. Are we doing the right thing? Is this, are we just being egotistical? Are we just blowing smoke up our butt? <laughs> Do we just think we're right and we're not? Like, where, is this really the best thing for us? So that's kind of the crazy Ivan thing.
That's pretty good. I mean, it definitely gives you an opportunity to tweak processes and, and recognize that, you know, are, are we doing this because it's traditional? Are we doing this because Chris Voss said so? <laughs> or, yeah. or are we doing it because it works? Yeah, I learned a long time ago as a boss the hard way that I am not the arbiter of all good ideas. And I actually am the arbiter of a lot of bad ideas. Uh, and, and it's very easy to get caught up in that whole God syndrome where you're like, I am the, I, you know, I've built this business and it's profitable and successful. And then, you know, it explodes in your face. And, and to me, uh, you know, getting other people in your organization to help you um, to do input. You know, we always built learning organizations organizations where the only stupid question was the unasked question, encouraging people to, uh, you know, learn about why we do things and wanting to make it so that we could, uh, you know, I, I don't want to be the guy who has to come up with all the ideas. I need some help. So um, I want people to go, hey, that idea is stupid and here's a better one. And, and sometimes that person, you know, having them on your board or in your organization, who's the that kind of negative Nancy one, you know, could be a boy or a girl, but you know, they're always just tubing whatever. Like every idea is a bad idea. But sometimes when those guys are dead on right, they're dead on right. They're gonna save you millions of dollars. <laughs> well, but it's important to be able to create a safe space for yeah, that exactly. kind of conversation. And that's challenging for organizations. Mm -hmm. It can be a lot of it comes down, and that's why I wrote Beacon's leadership. The beacon on the hill is the leader that everyone looks to. And so you set the standard for that environment or not like you can't just come out with the pr thing and go we should be a learning organization then you're closed off as leader to everything you've got to have a, a modicum of consistency within uh, you know what you convey your beacon if you will to your organization that goes he lives by his principles you know uh i talk about in the book about how anybody can be a leader whether they're uh, a ceo you don't have to have a leader title you can be a leader and uh, parents are incredible leaders. Like, I don't think parents even realize how much they lead. And, you know, kids kids see if you don't live your truth. You know, mm -hmm. my parents, they were, they were good parents. But, you know, they would teach us, don't lie. And they would tell us, you know, Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy are real. And we're like, wait, there's some stuff going on. You're not living your truth. Yeah. Uh, that was that was one of my biggest challenges because as a parent I chose I chose to to teach my kids that Santa Claus was a character and it, and I did it for that exact reason because I didn't want my kids at eight or nine years old to say my parents have been lying to me this whole time and and I I made that choice oh and, and it it was tough the the family the in laws some of the other folks were like that you're nuts that that doesn't make any sense I'm like no it does make sense if. <laughs> If I if I come out as a parent, and I say to my kids, "Don't lie to me," and then at eight or nine years old, they find out I've been lying to them about something so serious in their lives. Like that's a that's a heartbreaker. I mean, how many kids remember their heart being broken when they found out Santa Claus wasn't real? Uh -huh. I mean, and and so for me, it was it was it was it was absolutely. And my daughter now struggles with <laughs> how she's going to handle it with her kids and uh, and her husband, but. But that was my motivation was I don't want my kids to think it's okay to lie. And everybody's like, oh, it's no big deal. I'm like, you are planting seeds. Trust me. Yeah. So I appreciate you saying that, man. There's very few people on the planet that make that statement. Yeah, I mean, they they uh, that's pretty brave of you. I mean, hopefully you found that. I mean, a parent's job is to scar their children so that they spend most of their lives in psychology. Oh, don't uh, worry. I, I did you know, plenty of other did that? things. Okay, wrong. Don't as worry. long as you came up with something to <laughs> fill that bucket, you're fine. But yeah, yeah. The, whole, the whole Santa thing. But, you know, I mean, you have to live what, what parents don't. I, I mean, I don't want to make a general say. What, what a lot of parents, I don't think, don't realize is you can't tell your kids how to be good moral people and if you're not what it what you do influences them more than what you say oh absolutely and yeah. and the, obviously the, the the bigger challenge is for for me it's the earned respect as a as a parent right to you be a respect. leader to be a leader versus versus look i'm your parent you have to obey me right exactly my title and and the leadership in business happens the same way I've got the title of the boss, so you have to listen versus, look, I, I'm in this position to, to lead you and show you, but we're a team and I want to I guide this team as a group 
to be better and to have a better result. And and there is a huge difference. And we've all seen families that have the parent that is just the demanding, you know, egalitarian running the show. Um, but his kids, you know, his his kids are, are going to leave at 18 and never come back. Yeah. I, I think I may have gone through some of that experience at 18 with my, or with my dad. Uh, you know, he, you must respect me because I'm the, I'm the parent or the, you know, it, it conveys too in, in leadership, uh, of corporations, like you mentioned, you know, if, if the leader doesn't do what he says, you know, mm. you know, he's like, everyone must be honest and trustworthy in this corporation. You see him like, I don't know, stealing money out the back and, sleeping with the uh, the secretary on his desk you know and you're like wait you don't you don't seem to have a moral compass well i mean you, you look at enron obviously enron was the, <laughs> the biggest example you know their their employee guidebook that everybody had to sign said integrity and honesty with our clients was was number one but but cooking the books so that we all get rich really was number one yeah shell companies um <laughs> yeah that 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 whole thing you know and people notice they see it they see and they go, hey, you're full of shit. You know, it sounds like a George Carlin bit. You're full of shit. The funny um, thing, though, the funny thing, though, in Enron is that they all knew they were full of shit and they all put all their money in it. Yeah. Like, like, hey, we're going to ride this train. <laughs> we're going to ride scheme. this train right to the end of the line. Gotta love a Ponzi pyramid scheme. I think yeah. they're doing that now with some uh, <coughs> NFTs. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And I got a bunch of people that I guess are looking for work at McDonald's because their Bitcoin uh, investment oh, portfolios are man. crashing. So right. saw, who, who could have predicted that? Let's dig a little deeper into, into character and the importance of character for entrepreneurs and leaders. Yeah, let's go to my book, too, for that. I, I outlined, there's a character part of my book that I outlined where I talked about um the, the characters of of a leader and i talked about uh, to me the number one characteristic of of a character characteristic of a character for a leader is passion you have to be passionate and uh it's not emotionalism where it's just emotionalism for emotionalism sakes it's passion for a love of what you do of who you are of, of trying to lead a passion for wanting people to succeed um, and you have to be, uh, to be a really successful, like Steve jobs, maybe Elon Musk sort of person, you have to have a passion and you have to be able to convey that passion because I can't just sit up here and go, Hey, Robert, um, we really want the company to be successful this year and we want to make a $10 million and, uh, we just really need you to get pumped up and just try and be pumped up. Okay, man. Uh, we really need you to get excited about this. Yeah, but they're 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 bigger than cheerleaders, right? Obviously, yeah. you know, Elon, you know, is committed to he's passionate about Mars, he's passionate about the planet, and 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 he's you know selling his houses now because I don't need all these houses. I recognize that Mars is more important and I'm gonna put all this money into that. Yeah. And and so it's it is it is a passion. And Steve Jobs. You know, his passion got him fired at one point. <laughs> and That's then, of true. course, they realized, hey, wait, we need that guy. And I'm glad he got fired because Pixar is one of my favorite things in the world. And so if he hadn't got fired, Pixar would have never happened, probably. That's true. He said it was one of the, I think, I believe he's quoted as one, it was one of the best things that happened to him. Yeah, absolutely. And so great things have happened for all of us because because Steve Jobs got fired. <laughs> yeah. So I got my first entrepreneur job because I got fired. But yeah, passion <laughs> is a real big part of it because... You can like as like I I showed there. I mean, you can you can just you can just bark orders at people, but if you can't win their hearts and minds, their souls, you know, Steve Jobs got people to, you know, he's like, you know, see that mountain over there? We're gonna tear down that mountain and move it over there. We're gonna take like fifty tech devices and put them into a phone that's as thin as uh, half an inch. You know, one of my friends, Andy Grignon, worked on the was on the team that built the iPhone. He didn't He's want like, it to be a phone. That's the funniest thing about the whole story. Yeah, he hated true, the huh? phone. <laughs> yeah. And and Andy's like, we we're trying to put a fax machine in the thing, and you know, <laughs> rotary phones, and you're just, you know, you, the thing wasn't even working properly when they when they displayed it. It would crash like all the time. What's crazy now is it it can fax right. You you take a picture of a document, it yeah. scans it, and you you email it just like that. Yeah. The fax machine's been eliminated by the phone. 
Which is funny. There's still companies that have them, and they're like, "Can you fax it into us?" And you're like, "Ironic, right?" Like, they don't even print worth a lick. They never have, and yet we still keep sending something (laughs) over a fax. We will be right back after this short break. This episode is sponsored by the newly released book *Dream Life Planner: Move from Tired and Overwhelmed to Free and Empowered* by Noel L. Peterson. Available on Amazon, or you can order a personalized signed copy at. Empower, E M P O W E R, two dream.com. That's empower number two dream.com. If you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe, leave a review, tell your friends. Welcome back. Let's get back to more greatness. And so for me, passion is number one, vision and innovation is number two. You've got to have, uh, you got to be a visionary, you got to be in one innovation. You've got to be able to lead with passion and, and say, we're going over here. You know, S- Steve Jobs had what they called a uh, 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 reality uh, something field where uh, where he could just suspend reality, reality suspension field, basically, where he could suspend reality and go, we're going to do this. And everyone's like, how are we going to do that? And I'm like, we're going to figure it out. It's the same thing with John F. Kennedy, you know, saying, we're going to the moon. And everyone's like, uh, what did you just say? And that's the uh, power of power of imagination, no, right? I mean, no. and I think that's what's so great about Pixar is it, it as a company, but also as the, the vision that they have and the imagination that they've used to create those films and put those stories on, you know, yeah. in, in front of us is is really based on on that visionary idea of seeing seeing the impossible. Yeah, um, comes up all the time in my show. I loved the ideas of of the mind of a child and and the ability for us to tap back into that mind of a child or people like Steve Jobs who have managed to keep that mind of a child <laughs> into their adulthood and and there's so many elements of that mind you know not just the innocence but more importantly the imagination or the belief in the impossible that hey I can move that mountain from there to there or I can make this car fly or you know I'm going to land on you know sleep on the moon <laughs> you know all of those things are possible in the mind of a child. And then, of course, us adults, we mention it once. Well, I'm going to sleep on the moon. And you're like, well, how's that ever going to happen? Right. And everybody around you just crushes the idea, crushes the dream. And so we take that imagination and we shove it down into a dark hole inside of us. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like uh, Wednesdays for me. Um, <laughs> the, uh, you know, the, the mind of a child is 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 the grand innovator. You know, because it approaches everything without a bias and it looks at everything and innovates and says, why do you do it this way? You know, I mean, I never had children, but that's what children do, right? They, they come up to you. You know, I was watching a TikTok the other day where a little boy runs up to his mommy and asks if she has a, if she has a, a boy part and she's trying to explain to him why she doesn't. This is what kids do. Why, 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 why? It's maddening. That's why I didn't have kids actually. Um <laughs> Why? Why? I'm just like, I don't know. I'm putting it up for adoption. Um, the uh, That's why my kids are at military school until they're 18. No, but that's the beautiful part. Kids are inquisitive. That's why they're innovative. They they always ask why. And so that's what I talk about in the book, and that's what I did with my businesses. I would always ask why. That's the crazy Ivan. Why? Why do we do things this way? Why? And Because well, you said so, Chris. Well, maybe I was wrong. I'll admit that. Why? So um, that's the beauty of it. You know, innovating, vision, uh, honesty, integrity, and trust. You, your people have to feel that you're honest, integrity, and trust are at least straightforward. Them. You don't have to be Jesus Christ where you maybe never tell a lie or George Washington. But you, they have to feel that they can trust you um, and, and, and that you have their best interests at heart. And if they have that, they will do many, almost anything for you. When it really comes down to it, uh, even even sometimes if they're if you've deceived them, but you know don't do that. Uh, communication, selling, you got to be able to sell and communicate your vision. If you're a leader and you can't communicate vision, you know you're an ordained leader. You're given the CEO job. If you can't communicate that vision, like it goes nowhere. You can have the biggest, you know, you can have the most beautiful vision in your head, and you're like, wow, we should do this, but you never communicate it. Well. You're just going over with that. And then, of course, all the different aspects of good character. So, but well, like that last one, right? Being the, the communication element it is really important because I think, you know, two of the things we never learn in school is, is financial 
real financial, you know, anything <laughs> to do with how to really handle money and then communication and how to really handle relationships. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> school teaches all this stuff except for how to do the two most important things that are involved in a human life. <laughs> yeah. So let's dig into, into communication, obviously selling the vision, but communication in the aspect of human connection. Yeah. Yeah. That's really important because if you can't connect with people, if you can't, have rapport with them, empathy. You can't, um, you know, they, people have to feel that people just don't follow you as a leader because you have the title. Like there's a million people in your core, in a corporation where, you know, the guy's like, I'm the CEO. People are like, fuck that guy. Um, I'm just here for the paycheck. I'm just going to keep phoning it in. And there's organizations where a CEO has that power to communicate that he cares, that he has rapport with people, uh, that he has a vision when he talks to people. You hear it when he shakes hands, when he listens to people. Um, you can see it in empathy, you know, uh, in, how, in how they empathize with people and listen and, and, and care about people. You know, it, it comes across and people get it and they go, that guy gives a shit about me. So I'm going to give a shit about him and I'm going to go help uh, him and me achieve our dreams together. And that's, that's the real power of it. You know, otherwise you're, you're going to end up on a ship in the sea and they're going to, you're going to have a mutiny. Well, I think, gonna... I think you see that in corporations that, that, that it flows down from the leadership like Southwest airlines, mm -hmm. you know, the, when you, you see the, the, the lowest person in Southwest Airlines making jokes, having fun and, and communicating in a way that that is different than every other airline. But that all started with Herb Kelleher and and because he was a different kind of leader, but he inspired people to do something completely different. Yeah. I mean, the and, and really, I mean, we really look at that with Southwest or, you know, I was friends with the T-Mobile CEO, uh, you know, engaging the human spirit you know getting people to feel like they are part of the program and they're just not some cog in the wheel or some slave to the system people that feel like hey i have a part here i can do my part i can be my own kind of pseudo leader in the in the in the whole setup um you know it's 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 engagement of the human spirit and so inspiring that bringing that with passion communicating that getting people to feel like they can be part of something bigger than themselves. That's what motivates people to want to go the distance for a corporation or people or a parent or anything else in your life. Really. Well, and, and when they do that, right, when their people engage the human spirit, they interact with the clients completely differently. Yeah. And, and the customer service experience becomes something that's completely different. And, and you, we see, I see it all the time in, in companies that, I mean, you look at a McDonald's and obviously McDonald's, they're, they're, they're franchises, they're spread out all over the world. And yet the majority of them still have a pretty good customer service model. Chick-fil-A, incredible customer service model that they've, mm. that they've modeled and spread from store to store to store all across the country, you know, closed, closed one day a week and still sell more chicken than any other store. <laughs> In yeah, the world. <laughs> they have a line. They're they're right next to my gym, and sometimes their line is like blocking my thing. They have an In and Out Burger. In and Out Burgers, uh, pretty fun too. Uh, they always have a line, and then of course their secret menu, which is fun to play with. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's it's uh, you feel it in companies. You know, Starbucks. There's been a million times where sometimes Starbucks will hand me something, and they put way too much milk in it. Or, you know, they gave me foam and I didn't want the foam. You know, some there's some sort of tweak. And I'm not like a Nazi where I'm like, ah, I can't live with this. Ah, <laughs> you know, uh, but I'll be just like, uh, yeah, that's all. That's like way too much milk, man. And I usually tell them, I'm like, light on the milk, you know. And then you get it and you're just like, did you just give me milk with like a little cup of coffee poured into it? Because it looks like milk. And, uh, you know, they'll be like, hey, you know what? We'll fix it for you. Free on us. No, no questions asked, no hassle, no whatever. Boom, done. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thanks for letting us serve you. And it, you're right. It makes all the difference on the front line. Yeah. And and for people to, to recognize that that starts at the top. Mm -hmm. it, it absolutely starts at the top. And when you get to companies that have no customer service, they have no idea how to how to deal with people, you, you recognize that the leadership doesn't care. Yeah. Well, yeah. A lot of tech companies are that way, unfortunately. <laughs> they build customer service last because they don't care because most customers, most tech companies for social media, you are the product. So they don't care about you. 
they care about the advertisers they sell you to and everything else. But that's kind of, I, I have some issues with that. Um, but, uh, but you know, they should, they should treat you better, especially since you're the product. It's kind of dumb to think that way. But, uh, uh, yeah, let's mistreat our product so it's horrible. But, you know, we'll still sell to some, some people. Well, maybe it'll sell better if you treated your product better. I don't know. You produced hmm. a better product. Uh, maybe. You know. Twitter, Twitter has this problem. You know, Twitter, I think it was only profitable for what, two years out of, out of the last 20 or whatever, however long it's been, I've lost track. Um, you know, because they would just ban people all the time. You know, I, I, I first held up a hand in, uh, in uh, speaking engagements in 2011, 2012. And I'd be like, how many people here have been suspended by Twitter? You know, and their service was so awful. We'd just suspend anybody for anything. Sometimes just suspend a whole batch of accounts because their algorithm wasn't right. And I would ask CEOs, I'd be like, "Do you do you trust Twitter? Will you buy ads on Twitter when Twitter comes out with ads? No, we don't trust them because they they're always suspending us and our teams. And we finally gave up. And guess who we went to? Facebook. Hmm. And who won the ad war with Facebook and Twitter? Yeah, Facebook did. Yeah, absolutely. So going from character, you mentioned some really good character traits let's talk about the power of gratitude mm -hmm. gratitude is really important because you've you've got to appreciate what you have and and out of that kind of comes a mantra of having more i hate to say mindset i'm not a big fan of the word mindset um because there's so many of these people who do these vision boards and mindset and it, it gets a little hocusy pocusy fantasy of like you know um and it, it, and it sometimes it's kind of like it's kind of like, uh, what's the old line for Rolling Stones? You don't always get what you want. You get what you need. But, uh, uh, you know, you, 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 uh, with gratitude, you sit down and you appreciate what you have and what you, and that kind of creates a attitude of abundance where you're like, I have a really good life. You know, if you're constantly walking around with this negative thing, like I don't have enough, I don't have more, I need more. And I'm tired of mine. And you just have kind of this bad negative attitude kind of sets out your energy in the world and and uh to me gratitude is really important also it's, it's it kind of helps keep you grounded you go hey man i have a great life i mean i love my life now rather than running you know multiple companies with hundreds of employees and you know just nightmares and fires every day and and dealing with all there's a there's a point where the squeeze isn't worth the juice anymore and sometimes just peace and sanity and, and your life is better um you know maybe you won't make as much money maybe you will i mean for me that's you know it's pretty easy but um you know all the partners and the employee i, I could write four books of employee stories and all the stuff that <laughs> employees you know when you're a ceo you become the psychologist for everyone you know people come to you and they sit down and they go i'm having trouble selling and i can't make my quota this month and you're like what's the problem well i'm going through a divorce or, you know, my wife and I are having problems. And you're like, all right, well, so what do we got to do to fix you and your wife's problems so you can get your money back on my books? You know, it's all that stuff, you know. And, um, you know, I mean, you guys come in. You know, when you're a coach, and I'm talking as a coach in a sense, I mean, I guess when you're a normal coach. But, you know, when you're a coach on a team, you know, sometimes your your top player gets his head up his butt with some, you know, he's off his game and he's thinking about some the wrong thing. And and so you've got to be able to get play psychologist to get in there and fix his head and you know tear his brain open and go, what the hell's wrong? Where why are you off your game? You know. And uh, I do actually do talk about that in the book, the back to basics from Coach Wooden, I think it was. That was one of the things that I always had that was in my toolbox, going back to basics. And, uh, he would, uh, he would tell people, Hey, quit, quit. You're not making your free throws. You're just spending all your time doing those pretty, you know, dunks from running down court slam dunks that, yeah, they look cool, but you can't make your free throw shack. Um, so we need you to just focus on the basics. Give me the basics. Give me, give me some free throws. Don't, don't, I don't, I don't need to see the dunks. You know, well, and, and basics for for Coach Wooden went all the way down to how you tied your shoes and exactly. put on your uniform, and so he made sure you understood that every detail mattered. Yeah, yeah. So back to the basics was 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 very real, yeah. and and of course the the best players in the world still took 
20 practice shots from every spot on the court. Right. And, and so that the amount of time and, and, and effort spent in, you know, good practice led to good results on the court. Yeah. I think Michael Jordan is one of the few people who can just be like, yeah, I'll just do whatever I want. Um, but there you have the passion for the game. But I, I imagine he had a standard. And of course, he practiced hard, worked hard, and had great leaders, uh, Kareem Abdul Jabbar, all the great, all the greats did. But you know, you got to get in and crack people open and fix them. And so, uh, you know, gratitude is just really important. It, it keeps you grounded, keeps your head in the right place, helps you make it appreciate what you have. And if you love what you have, it, it seems to grow. So, what's been the impact of hosting a podcast? Um, I don't know. People run up to me screaming all the time. Somewhere, I don't remember when, it was in the early 10,000s, I was, you know, doing the announcement for the show, the Chris Voss show.com. And um, somewhere in there, I was listening to Howard Stern, and Howard Stern was doing the bit he does from the movie uh, NBC. NBC. You know, thanks for listening to NBC. And he was doing the parody that he always does about how, you know, they were such they were so awful to him about how he wasn't doing the, I think there's the famous scene with Paul Giamatti in the film where he's like, no, you're not doing it right. It has to be NBC, you know? And uh, so he was doing that. And for like, I don't know, a month, he was just constantly hitting on it and, and doing a callback on that joke. And so for kind of a week, I just kind of did that as a, uh, as an homage to that. And I was just doing the Chris Voss show. .com, and I would just kind of like sing the ending. And I would change it up, you know, the Chris Voss show dot com, you know, and I did that for like a week and then I stopped doing it. I was like, okay, that bit's done, you know, whatever, move on, experiment with something else. And I got calls from everywhere, like calls, like no one ever calls me. And uh, I got calls like from Canada and shit. And they're like, hey, man, why aren't you doing the thing anymore? And I go, what thing? And they go, the Chris Voss show singing thing. And I go, that, that's stupid that's the dumbest thing ever i like guess i just did that for dumb fun because sometimes you know sometimes you play a dumb straight and you, you know when you when you die you kill so uh in comedian terms and so I, i'm like yeah i did it for a week and it's done and they're like no that's the funniest thing ever you have to do that people are going to remember that people like singing with you and i'm like get the hell out <laughs> And so I started doing it as the intro to the show. And so we sing the, the Chris Voss show, even though now there's like a jingle at the front. But uh, when the intro, the, welcome to the Chris Voss show dot com. You know, we have people on from CNN on looking at me like, seriously? And, <laughs> I saw uh, I saw Dave Dave Navarro recently, and he just said, dude, I thought we were getting introduced to a monster <laughs> truck show. He thought we were getting a monster truck show. So what's funny now is the impact is – People run up to me when they meet me or when they see me or they call me or sometimes they'll send a message and they'll run up to me and go scream my face. The Chris Voss show. .com! And you're like, whoa, whoa, excuse me. Who the, who the fuck are you? You know, but um, that's that's been a, lar a large part of the impact where people people like you. I don't know. Uh, some... At least you have a fan or two. Yeah, I have like three or something. <laughs> and mom doesn't count mom doesn't count she doesn't watch the show I mean, I <laughs> she if she watches the show she's just disappointed and in, in uh in everything all right so let's talk about the book and, and the impact of being an author the that's more be, recent the impact of being an author is pretty cool i'm only six months into my first book um it's been really interesting i've had a few people write me and they're like yeah i read it twice and i'm like seriously i didn't even read it once um <laughs> No, I actually did. I had to read that thing like a hundred times in editing. Uh, that's it's like uh, it's I was brutal. Ready. It's brutal. It, editing, editing makes is you hate brutal. Your book. Like I would call my friends who are authors, and I'm like, I'm done. I'm throwing this thing out the window, and uh, they go, No, the fact that you're at that part means you're almost there. Just go a little bit further. And uh, I'm like, I'm in a, I'm in, you know, I, I was writing stuff. I was doing that whole typewriter thing from The Shining, where it's like. All work and no play. I I did do something bad. I I put out a book in three months that I wrote in three months and then uh, published within I don't know a month or two after that. Um, so I did a whipping, uh, crazy pace of stuff. 
Um, but you know, a lot of my stories, you know, a lot of these are stories I've perfected over 20, 30 years telling, teaching people, 40 years teaching people. And, and so it, it wasn't too hard to slam it all down. It was the editing. That was the nightmare. And, and of course, after you got all down on paper, you're like, this, we need to move this around. And where does this go? And how does this make sense? And, you know, then you have everybody up your butt. They're like, don't do a memoir. And you're like, dude, my stories are the, I can't make up other people's stories. It's my stories. <laughs> What do you want me to do? Like, do it. You know, so there's some people they want me to do an encyclopedia dictionary, Peter Drucker style on leadership. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to be here for years trying to do that. So it's been fun. People like the book. Uh, it's got a pretty good reviews. Um, I got some good CEO reviews on it. And uh, it's been pretty fun uh, so far. We're, we're now working on book two and three. Um, and they're, they're kind of something that can run jointly. Um, but, uh, it's been fun. It's been nice to have that author title. People are like, people, people treat you differently. Oh, you're an author. You know, you know, even chicks, chicks are like, Oh, you're an author. Mm, come back to my place. Yeah. I haven't met that crowd yet. That's good. Yeah. Well, I'm single, you know, <laughs> so you, you talked about vision and, and a little bit about design and so let's talk a little bit about an entrepreneur's ability to design their business around their life mm -hmm. um you know it, it, the the great thing about being an entrepreneur is you have that freedom to do that uh, a lot of entrepreneurs approach something where they find something in life that bugs them that's broken and they go somebody needs to make this better well i guess i'll do it because i don't know it's no one else wants to do it you know you call up the company and go hey you should make this better and they're like screw you we're making money bye click and they're like, well, I'll just do it better. You know, um, a good example, I saw a gal who, uh, who, who was single and I don't know where she was in her life, but she was single and she's like, Hey, I need tools to fix stuff around the house. Cause I don't have a handyman. And, uh, uh, she went to the store and, you know, was really turned off by all the manly colors and the manliness of, you know, tools, and the way they're built. So she came with pink tools. They're kind of more built for feminine hands because, you know, women's hands are smaller um, unless you're really um, a poorly DNA man um, or you know, an ex-president. The, uh, um, you know, so they made they made the hands uh, perfect for um, women and pink because women, you know, they like that color. And, you know, they, they look a little more feminine as opposed to, you know, this this block of crap that we always have in a tool. Uh, you must hit it. And so, you know, something like that. And then, and then turns out they find that what they wanted to fix and change uh, changes everything for them. And living the life of an entrepreneur is hard. It, it's 24 seven. You sleep and you dream, you eat, you sleep, you poop business. Um, it's, it's, it never ends. Um, but it will make you super um, self actualized. Uh, hopefully, usually it teaches people that, you know, the buck stops at you. You don't have any boss. You can't clock out on Friday and be like, I'm not going to think about business today. You can't, you're not, you're not free. Um, and it can be wearing because of that, but it's part of the gig, but the freedom it gives you, you know, Hey, if I want to write a check and go to Vegas and take a day vacation or a weekend vacation, I can, you know, most people don't have that sort of luxury, you know, uh, people, people always, I take my vacations when people aren't taking their vacations. So the whole world takes vacation at the same time. Like everybody does more Memorial day at the same time. <laughs> you're stuck in traffic for half of the Memorial day. And you're just like, well, how's this holiday? Um, and so it gives you a lot of freedom and yeah, you're right. You can wrap your life around. You can spend more time, you know, since 2004, I I've been able to spend more time with my dogs. My dogs love me. I get to see them. I get to play with them more. Um, they probably are sick of me too. Um, but uh, you know, you, you can just do stuff. You know, if I if I'm sitting around half through halfway through the day and I'm just like, I need a break. I go play a video game for an hour or something. You know, take some time out, come back. You know, you can't do that work. So let's else. dig into that a little bit more. The idea of of the value of play and fun, right? Cause obviously yeah. you're on, you, you mentioned it, right? Entrepreneur, your brain's on 24 seven. It's thinking of ideas. It's constantly working on the business. It's constantly, you know, trying to figure out which freaking Facebook ad to make freaking better so that you can, you know, get one more lead. But how can you turn that off for just a, a bit with play and fun? 
What I recommend, I was really bad. I talk about this in the book. I was really bad for years where I didn't, earn, I never took a vacation because to me, I just, I would just be like, okay, how much money am I losing when I'm out of the office? You know, and I'm greedy. So I'm like, I'm not going to leave the office, but it, it, it reached a point of burnout where it's like, you got to take some time off, man. You got to get out. You got to go, you got to go get your freak on. And so what I would start doing is, is I, I realized what we talked about earlier, where people run for this mantra of like, I'm just going to take a vacation once a year. In the meantime, I'm going to do as much brain damage as I can for that year and, you know, barely get to the end of it. And I'm going to want to murder everybody by the time I get to my vacation. And so what I advise in the book is take getaways on weekends and go places, get a bed and breakfast. And, you know, maybe if some people like to go to New York or some busy city, you know, there's a lot of people do this thing. Now you see them doing what do they call them? Staycations mm -hmm. where you don't only really turn into a whole production. That's a pain in the ass, especially if you've got to move the family around. Uh, but you just go stay in a local hotel. It's like camping. I guess it's the new version of camping with air conditioning and heating. Um, but uh, uh, I would just, I would try and go to places that were peaceful. So I'll go to a really exclusive restaurant someplace where there were just fields and, and uh, really nice environments. Uh, you know, a, a good place is Sun Valley. You can go up to Sun Valley. It's really small town. There's not a lot of traffic. Uh, beautiful vistas everywhere. Beautiful scenery everywhere. Really, not, I mean, that's where the Allen Company has their billionaires, you know, all come to uh, at the Sun Valley Lodge. Um, you know, I just take off to places that were kind of remote uh and sometimes a bed and breakfast you know sometimes where you still kind of have some people around you but you 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 can kind of have your space and you can just kind of chill out sometimes listen to that peace and quiet is really important nice yeah i like that all right chris what's the what's the big dream the big dream uh for me <laughs> yeah <laughs> for other people i don't know what their dreams are uh uh, I mean, I mean, if I'm in your dreams, people, well, then that's your problem. Uh, the big dream. I don't know what the big dream is at this point. There's not really a big dream. My big dream nowadays is is for my health, my quality of life. I've been going to the gym for the past nine months for the first time ever in 54 years. Um, and I've been really loving that journey and what comes on and the discipline that comes out of it because Sometimes you need some discipline to take your sore butt up to the gym again another day. It's like, I'm still hurting from yesterday. <laughs> you're like, you're going. And, you know, that's the discipline. And, you know, putting yourself through that pain and and uh, and pleasure reward principle. You know, it, it's kind of funny. It's it's a real, it brings it really home because with businessing, with running a business or starting a business, you have to go through the pain principle before you get to the let the uh, to the pleasure principle of the profit you know you've got to go through that pain of starting it losing money and working hard and going i don't know you know it's when i wrote my book i'm like no one's gonna read this turd uh why does anyone gonna care like you, you know sometimes you get those thoughts like about halfway through the thing or three quarters of the way through the thing or in editing and you're like oh man you know what if i do all this work and like no one reads this or cares about it like at all and you're just like that's gonna suck but you, you just have to keep fighting through and then you get to the pleasure point. So working out is a really good sort of physical manifestation of what your experience is in the universe. So now I'm just trying to make myself as healthy as I can, get as, uh, get as uh, in shape as I can, uh, write more books, um, do more speaking now that we've, you know, we can actually go out and run around in the sun and um, just try and live my quality of life uh have peace of mind and uh do what i want to do travel so you mentioned the the routine of the gym what other what other routines are important to you in your daily life um drinking coffee <laughs> i like that routine that's my favorite routine uh the uh i don't have a lot of routines i live my life the way i want to uh you know i'm single never married I couldn't afford all the divorces. Um, I'm still <laughs> at saving you, up. At least you knew that ahead of time. Let's yeah, I, I'm. I, the joke is, I, I never married because I'm still saving up for the first divorce. Um, you know, I was engaged twice. I just, I just couldn't make the thing work. And and some of my, some of my life is, has has uh, done a lot of. I, you know, I lived like 20 years in Vegas, so there's been a lot of partying that's gone on, and uh, I might be a little broken. 
but uh you know it's it's uh it, i don't know man where, where was it before i segued off on the vegas thing <laughs> routine I mean, you think of some partying <laughs> so i don't really have routines i wake up when i want to um the podcast has a schedule i think that's the only time i need to appear before people or consulting and so i kind of i'll work around that schedule but for the most part i do what i want when i want if i'm not you know being paid to do something and um you know that's that's the best way to do is to have that freedom to where you're like do i want to work this hour or do i want to go goof off but you can't goof off too much no i love it all right so you've just spent an hour sharing coffee with a a young entrepreneur and you want to leave them with chris voss's words of wisdom what would you share um chris voss's words of wisdom uh read my book about the nine dot uh the nine dot uh experiment and um uh, learn to think out of the box. That's basically what you learn from that. Learn to think outside of the box. Learn to take apart systems, worlds, everything that's given to you in life. Learn to to get outside of it and look at it and go, why do we do things this way? And why do people do things this way? You know, I grew up uh, I grew up with a hardcore religion, and religion hated me because I would be like, why do you do it? Why did Jesus do this? Or why is that? Because this over here doesn't match with that. And and they'd be like, shut up and have faith, idiot. And I'd be like, no, you really need to solve this equation for me because these two things do not get along. And you need to do that through all your life, whether it's social paradigms, you know. Um, I'm like that. People are like, you got to get married if you want to be happy. I'm like, I don't know. I'm not really sure. Um, I've seen a lot of unhappy married people. Yeah, yeah, I'm not really <laughs> sure. Maybe maybe there's a better way. Um, you know, look at life and and just because a lot of people do that. They, they, they're born. You know, it's the old line from Fight Club, you know, well, I was born and you know, I said to my dad, what do you do now? He's like, grow up, go to school. And I grew up, went to school. And then my dad says, uh, you know, uh, what do you do now? Go to college. All right. So I went to college. And my dad says, I said, what do you do now? He goes, go get a job. Uh, what do I do now? Uh, go get a wife and raise some kids. And you're just like, you know, maybe, maybe he's wrong. <laughs> maybe, there's a, maybe there's a better way. And so, um, you know, it, it's it, get out of the box and look at paradigms. Start questioning a lot of stuff that you're done. You don't need to turn into a thing where you end up with a conspiracy theorist because you question everything a little too far. You know, I mean, we all know the world's flat. Or give me a break. It's kind of like a pizza at Pan Pizza or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> as long as it's got a thick crust to keep us all on. I'm just here for the pepperoni. <laughs> oh, Chris. Thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate the conversation. Appreciate your humor and definitely appreciate the wisdom that you shared. Thanks, man. Appreciate being on. Absolutely. So there'll be an email later. Just uh, we ask for all typical stuff, a short bio for the introduction, headshot for the website, any links you want to include so that we can put that in the description. Who do you know that would make a great guest that you'd be willing to introduce me to? And then I do ask for a mailing address just because I send a card to say, cool. hey, thanks. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. I'll get you a copy of our book, too. Oh, so, sweet. Our book? So, I have you, six you personalities. You and the voices in your head. Pretty much. The six <laughs> personalities. Because <laughs> that, that psychologist didn't get them all out. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's too many of them to stop at this point. <laughs> oh, man. Appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Robert. I certainly appreciate it. Take care, buddy. If you enjoyed the show, please like, subscribe, or leave a review. We have a free gift for you at addvaluemindset.com. That's addvaluemindset.com. We've collected some of the best mindset secrets shared by successful entrepreneurs on our podcast, and we want to give them to you for free. addvaluemindset.com. In our next episode... John Mitchell and Robert talk about thinking grow rich and how Napoleon Hill leaves the reader wondering if they'll ever know the secret. John has found the secret and teaches others how to apply the secret to their lives. John understands reprogramming the subconscious, which controls most of our thinking.